two, one. And we're sending over to Facebook and we should be good to go. I'd like to welcome everybody back today, Alabama Care. We have the pleasure of having Mr. Jack Carney with us today of Carney Dye LLC. And today we're gonna to be talking about elder law. And I'll kind of bring up uh, my screen here so we can follow that along. Let me share the documents that Jack has brought to us today. So today we're gonna to be talking about elder law, the basics of elder law, the rules you should know. And at the end, we're gonna do some real world examples that I think that you guys like and that I always like to go through, kind of cement what we've talked about. And at this point, I'd like to hand it back over. And uh, Mr. Carney, if you would introduce yourself. Yes, I appreciate it, Alex. My name's Jack Carney. I'm an attorney here in Birmingham, been practicing law for almost 19 years now. And uh, our firm, Carney Dye, with three attorneys, uh, focuses on wills, state planning, special needs planning, and elder law. That's one of the components of, of what we do. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for sharing them, uh, this afternoon with us. And we had talked, we weren't really sure what we were gonna uh, be going over this month. Um, and elder law kind of came up and I hope that you guys really take uh, a lot of stuff from this. It was something that I thought you guys would enjoy. And then Jack pointed out to me that there are a lot of practical things for even children and families of special needs outside of just what you think uh, elder law would be for parents. Um, so at that, let's kind of jump into it here. Uh, and Mr. Carney, if you would take over. Sure, absolutely. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the basics of elder law and share a couple of good resources with everybody. One is the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, NALA for short. Uh, you can go to their website, NALA.org, a lot of good resources for the public, um, a lot of ways to connect with elder law practitioners. And it gives us a basic definition here that elder and special needs law includes helping families with planning for incapacity and long-term care, Medicaid and Medicare coverage, health and long-term care insurance, and healthcare decision-making. And so particularly for you know, this audience, special needs planning is considered in the professional community to be a part of elder law and elder law practitioners, uh, primarily because we deal with a lot of the same things. Uh, if you're talking about caring for somebody who's getting older, maybe needs some assistance, maybe they don't have the resources to provide for the assistance they need, um, they might require some elder law planning or at least some guidance to resources that can help them. And the same thing with our family members with a disability, might not have the resources, they need some guidance to get to those resources. So really they, they go hand in hand with what we're, what we're talking about. Yeah, when you say it like that, I imagine that children and babies need a lot more help. And then as we get older, our parents need a lot more help, we'll need a lot more help eventually. So uh, kind of the same thinking goes behind planning for that. It is, and it's sort of, a lot of times we, um, we think about, and you know, I found myself in this situation now, I'm caring for children, I'm helping care for parents. And then I somehow, I somehow got to take care of myself. <laughs> so somewhere, and, and so we're looking out for everybody sometimes, or we're in this certain, uh, certain folks are in this sandwich generation, they call it. We're, you're caring for elderly aging parents. You're caring for a child, maybe that's a child with a disability. And then you also have to care for yourself. And part of this conversation today will be, well, how do we care for our parents? And how do we take care of ourselves? Should we, uh, develop some type of condition or have a medical incident that requires long-term care, keeping in mind that we might also have a child we're leaving at home to take care of. So how, how can we balance all those things and how can we allocate resources appropriately? So hopefully that's one thing we'll talk a little bit about today. And I'm sure there are a lot of families that can feel a little overwhelmed in balancing those three things, um, you know, but planning ahead and going over what to you know, reviewing what we're going to go over today can really help that. Now, sure. yep. you mentioned that um, the elder law, is that, and I'm going to share the screen here, is that something that you have to be certified to do? It's a great question. You, question, you don't, um, much like, you know, I equate it to sometimes, sometimes people call themselves a financial planner. And really anybody can call themselves a financial planner, but there are such things as certified financial planners. And those are certified by a certain organization. So with a designation, it doesn't mean necessarily you're better. It just means you've gone through some rigorous protocol in order to have this organization say that you appear to know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, and we're gonna give you our, 
our seal of approval. And I just want to point you to uh, this is something I did several years ago, primarily just to learn a little more about elder law as our clients were seeing it more and more. The National Elder Law Foundation is at nelf.org and they have a certification protocol and it is pretty rigorous. It requires an examination um, the, and a, a lot of other steps. You have to prove to them that you spent so much time on so many cases over five years that are classified as elder law in order to get this designation. And I share it because you might have a family member in another state, um, you're trying to help them, maybe they live in you know, California, and you don't know who to turn to, you can go to NELF's website, click on the state of California, and you'll get a list of practitioners mm -hmm. that are CELA certified, certified elder law attorney. So regardless of where you have the need, this is just one of several resources besides NELA that you could go to to find somebody if you have some questions or need some assistance. And it's, you know, they, they, they recertify us every, every few years. We have certain continuing education requirements. So the NELF board is really serious about their standards. Mm. I like how you brought up being in a different state. And I have friends that I play hockey with, and they're a little bit older than I am, but they have parents in either Michigan or somewhere out of state. And they're really not sure. Maybe there's an, another family member up there with them, but someone's not really taking the helm, contacting professionals and getting legal advice. So this is a great resource that I could give to that friend saying, hey, you know, your mom who's in her upper 80s, um, you know, you're thinking about kind of this stuff. This is where you should start uh, to find some. I think, and there can be some good resources and information. There's a lot of good community information on that site. And it might just be finding some resources, get it pointing in the right direction. And, and one thing to keep in mind is it's very state specific, much like you know, you've probably talked about before with different Medicaid programs. It might be funded with federal dollars, but it's administered by each individual state. And oftentimes they have little nuances uh, about their program. So it's important to work with somebody in that area um, to make sure you're compliant with state law. And, uh, and it helps again to have, again, I, I don't wanna say that just because someone doesn't have a certification doesn't mean they cannot help you. That's not true at all. Uh, it's important to just make sure someone has that understanding of, the various issues that come up. We'll talk a little bit about, about what is in elder law. It's not only, you know, doing estate planning. It's not only benefit planning. There's tax planning because some of the decisions you make might have income tax consequences you're not aware of. So balancing all that together to try to give folks the best direction forward is, is how I look at it. Yeah, there's a lot of things to juggle there and one wrong move and you can have some serious consequences to those assets that you have in future sure. generations. Sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and we'll get into the basics of elder law. Let me go ahead and share that. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I try to keep, keep it simple. Um, at least it helps me in looking at there's two basic issues, because elder law is so expansive. Um, another definition could be it's anything that, any legal issue that comes up when someone ages or has a disability. And that could be anywhere from fair housing to tax credits to Medicare coverage. But for me, some of the basic issues we address, and I'll talk about that more in a second as you know, step one and two, uh, decision-making and capacity. You know, issue number one, as we age, we may lose capacity. We may lose it permanently. We may use it, lose it temporarily. But regardless, we need to have some plan in place as to what happens when we lose that capacity, that inability to make decisions for ourselves. That has some significant legal and financial effects if we don't pre-plan and have something like a durable power of attorney that allows somebody to make decisions for us. If we don't have a power of attorney, we may end up, I know I've talked about it to this group before, in a protective proceeding. We may have a guardianship or a conservatorship. We may have to, somebody may have to go to court in order to take care of our affairs. Whereas with a little bit of pre-planning, we could have done it in advance and it's a lot easier. So that's, that's usually number one concern. And number two is paying for long-term care. You know, how I, I have this, you know, mom's in the nursing home or mom's in rehab coming off a fall at the hospital and they're telling me now she has to go to the nursing home. She can't go home. And it's going to cost this amount every month. It's good. And how are we going to pay for that? It's going to be $8,000 a month. Her income is only $2,000. How are we going to cover that expense that she now requires? And that's a big part of it. And a lot of elder law is 
um, what I kind of call preventative planning in advance, just thinking ahead. You know, this can be done at any age, by the way. Elder law is just not for the elderly. <laughs> I don't even like the term elder law necessarily. Um, it could be anywhere from uh, looking at a long-term care insurance policy when you turn 50 or 60 um, to doing crisis, what we call crisis planning. There's preventative planning and there's crisis planning. We're on the we're on our way to the nursing home. What do we do? What can we do? There, there are some options. There's some options. It feels like it kind of hits you in the face when you're on the way to the, the nursing home there. Like, oh, this is happening. Well, and it's kind of like with most things, your options are more limited when, when the crisis occurs. It's kind of, uh, you know, you know, buying a long-term care insurance policy is great in advance. Buying one when you're on your way to the nursing home is not possible. Much like paying for home insurance like I do now. I can do that now, but I cannot buy a policy if my home's on fire. You know, it's just, it's too late. So we have to look at whether preparing in advance is something we should be doing or th at least thinking about. Maybe that's the key. And I've had um, friends and, and others ask, you know, about nursing homes and the cost of it. Would you say seven or 8,000 is pretty standard? I would. Um, I've actually, there's been some that have been up as high as $10,000 a month, depending on wow. the care. And we talk a little bit about that. I mean, just because it's that expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's the best care. I mean, nursing homes, there's a the state of Alabama puts out ratings on nursing homes. They're inspected all the time. You can look that up. Um, and, you know, they're, they're very highly regulated, uh, but it is expensive. And that's just something that if you get to that level, and to me, we you're just kind of talking around nursing homes. That's, that's the last, it's the last stage. That's the highest level of care. That's what we're talking about. There's a lot in the middle, and that's what we call assisted living. And then there's one step. Look, think about steps of levels of care is how I think about it. Mm -hmm. There might be nursing home high, middle is assisted living. You need just a little bit of help, not a lot. And then there's independent living. You don't need any help, but it's nice to have somebody to check in on you from once in a while. Mm -hmm. And each of those are different levels. Nursing home care is the only one that Medicaid will pay for. There's no government benefit to pay for assisted living or independent. So that's also something to keep in mind. Now, granted, assisted living and independent living is a whole lot less expensive. Long-term care policy could pay for that. Um, people private pay for that or use their income to pay for it. Um, but that's just kind of, again, a general principle of nursing home is the only one where needs-based assistance is available at a certain point. And I didn't realize that Medicaid would only pay for the nursing home there and not assisted living. So along those steps, you have to plan <clears throat> financially for that. Yeah. Um, now, the long-term care insurance, this is something that I've done a little bit of research on in the past for some of my family members. Um, and speaking with her, it was decided it was something we were not going to do. Mm -hmm. um, she's in her almost 90 years old and didn't feel like she'd get approved. And I was like, hey, you know, at least try it. But she she didn't want to move forward with it. Um, is that something that you recommend most families try for? That's a great question. I, I would recommend most families at least take a look at it. You know, and that's that's kind of, it's, it's more of let me explore it as an option. And it's such an interesting, um, it's such an interesting industry, long-term care insurance. I don't want to speak too much to it or overstep my bounds to the insurance industry. Uh, but it, you know, in my understanding of it, it's changed a lot. You know, there used to be traditional long-term care policies that were in place. A lot of those companies and policies don't exist anymore. Or if they do, they're so cost prohibitive because premiums cannot be locked in. And so what ended up happening was people were writing these 15, 20 years ago, and the need far outweighed what they expected. You know, insurance companies are hoping a lot of people pay them money and only a few people use the service. Well, what happened was more people than they anticipated used the service. And I think it's something that we can see as, as our medicine gets better, as we, you know, we, we last longer and more people are going to need assistance. Um, and so the insurance industry was not ready for that. And so a lot of that has changed. And now um, you might see some more traditional policies. I still do. And they're very helpful when clients have them. Um, I do think you need to look at it as I would. Is this cost prohibitive like any financial decision? Is this worth it? What does it cost me each year to pay this premium? And 
what benefit will that pay? Mm -hmm. and, and make that analysis. And that's something that can be done. Or do I have sufficient resources that if I needed assistance with assisted living, I could survive? Um, I counseled somebody once that it was paying for a long-term care policy to pay for her care. She could barely afford it, but she didn't have many assets left. I mean, she had lived a nice long life and, you know, the decision we came with was to, you know, that she came to with some guidance was to let it go, not continue to pay for it. And if she needed long-term care, Medicaid would pay for it because she had no assets. A lot of times we get a long-term care policy to like any insurance to protect assets we have. Mm -hmm. So that the long-term care policy pays for our care. Um, one thing to think about, you've seen uh, the newest development, if you talk to any financial or insurance advisor, is what they call hybrid policies. So now you're starting to see uh, permanent life insurance policies that have a long-term care rider. I um, like that, how they, because they're kind of the same thinking. They are, and it's really, it's actually really clever, and it's a way to address that problem of the traditional long-term care policy, of people just paying in and maybe the need being too expensive. So... There's a lot of different hybrid policies. So it's like buying an insurance policy and like a traditional insurance policy, if you pass away, the proceeds go to your heirs. However, with the hybrid policy, if you need long-term care, you can start pulling from the value of the policy through a rider on your policy to pay your expenses. Now that will ultimately likely Again, I don't have, I haven't looked at one of those recently. I've looked at them before. That will probably, re that will reduce your benefit and your economic interest in the policy, but you're, you're taking it for yourself because you need it. Mm -hmm. And usually those hybrid policies, whether you take it or not, the long-term care benefit that is, they have something that goes to the family. Mm. You know, because a lot of times people didn't like, I'm paying a lot of money for a long-term care insurance policy. And if I don't use it, then I don't, I don't get any benefit back. And that's true. That's more like traditional home insurance. If you don't use it, you don't get any benefit. Uh, the hybrid policy, I think, tries to give you long-term care protection and, um, you know, and a little bit of benefit as well with a financial product. So all that to be said is, I think to answer your question, Alex, is a good question is, I, I always encourage people to explore it, to look at it, to talk to some insurance and financial professionals and, and just see if that makes sense. See them. It, it 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 might it could give you some really good peace of minds, and and I've seen some good come from um, long term care policies. And if obviously you want to look at the policy and see what's it going to cover, how many days, how many years of a benefit will it pay? Um, it's got feature. Most have features that most people in this audience would be familiar with of respite care. They might you know you might have a somebody has a long-term care policy, they don't need to go into an institution or an assisted living facility, but they just need some at-home care or maybe some occasional respite care for their caregivers. Most long-term care policies will provide that. That's so a big thing. And we're, we're actually gonna do a broadcast on respite care in the next few weeks. That'd be That's great. Cool. Very, very, very important. You know, that um, caring for the caregivers is part of kind of what we're talking about today a little bit. We have to take care of ourselves too, in addition to those we care for. And, and long-term care might be a tool, you know, there's so many options. That might be a way you take care of yourself if you're worried, I don't want to exhaust my estate because I have a dependent. So I don't want to exhaust it on my own care. What is there something else I can do And exploring a long-term care insurance policy might, might do that because then that will take care of you. At least that's what they're designed to do so that any other assets could be preserved for your dependents or your family. I think it's definitely something to let, uh, look into. You know, we hear that we're living longer, the medicine's better. And then I also hear like, <clears throat> you know, a thousand dollar medical bill will throw a lot of people off. Uh, and that's a huge expense. So if you're able to afford it, this will help uh, kind of go through that process. And we all get there eventually. I hate to say it, but I'm slowing down. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's like a well, slap in the it, it ha and it's hard to accept that reality. And as a practitioner, it's easier for me. But, you know, like someone said to me once, I heard and I liked it. They said, if, we're, if you're lucky to live long enough, you'll eventually hear bad news from a doctor. You know, it's just, <laughs> just going to have, you're going to have to face it uh, if you live long enough. And that's true. We're all going to have to face it. And part of this elder law planning and long-term care planning is facing it, you know, at least for a moment to get affairs in order. So that when that time does come, then again, 
they tell us that three, uh, it, the numbers are really high, like three out of four people are going to need some type of long-term care. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the number of people who will become disabled because of old age prior, you know, before dying prematurely, you know, I tell folks all the time when we do a will, it's more likely we're going to use your power of attorney before we use your will when it comes to documents, because it's much more likely for all of us to suffer incapacity mm -hmm. than it is to die prematurely. Whatever comfort that is, you can take from that. <laughs> so just, there's, maybe there's some comfort for you, but it, 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 it's a reality, and we can do so much, so much by some simple planning. I want to go in my sleep. I want it to be quick and sudden, but I know that's probably the, uh, the percentages don't agree with that. Um, and I don't want to go too far into long term care uh, yep. insurance there, but we do have a question uh, in the chat. Clifton Hasten says, What age would someone be uh, to start looking for that policy? That's a great question. I, I kind of hemmed and hauled around like 50 or 60. Um, I, th I think it's when you're in your 50s, maybe close to 60. Um, I, know, I, mean, I know talking to some insurance professionals when they say if you're in your 30s or 40s, it's, I, think, I think you could get it. Um, and maybe these hybrids may open that a little more, open that door a little more. I see most people around, you know, in the 50s. Um, is a is sort of that age because it's a it's an interesting dilemma because you want to be old enough and start the process when it's more of a reality in the nearer future but you don't want to be too old that you have you start having uh, conditions diagnosed that prevents you from getting that policy and your insurance goes up <laughs> it, or it goes up like it's a you know and there are certain conditions that they just cannot write long term care or maybe that rider on I understand the hybrid policies have a little more flexibility um, but you know we're all when I, when I was younger getting insurance, you know, folks would tell me, you're just one diagnosis away from not getting insurance anymore. So yeah, best to ask. So I, I, that seems to be the age in those, you know, the 50s, 60s where you want to really So what you're really saying is like starting in your early 60s is when the doctor is going to say, well, we're noticing something here. Yeah, maybe so. But if you're, I, technically you could get something in 70s or 80s. I mean, I think I've had people look at that, uh, 70s at least, but it, it I think it just, and again, with the grain of salt that I'll defer to my insurance colleagues out there, it's probably too old, probably too cost prohibitive. And, um, you know, at that point, so there, I think there is that sweet spot. When you mentioned that they went through a lot of reforms, a lot of people signed up and then it was a lot of money that the insurance companies are spending. I thought, no, I don't think Warren Buffett uh, is going to own one of those insurance companies anytime <laughs> soon. I don't know. I can't even recall if he did, but it's, it was something I think no one under, you know, even underestimated. I mean, we know this was coming, but we underestimated the need. Um, and, and it is, and, and long-term care insurance policies, the premiums, they try to keep them level, uh, but they're not, and they could go up. And there are some companies that had risen, had to raise the premiums, and that caused a lot of people to drop the coverage. Yeah. Because that's what they needed. Because again, they have to have enough reserves to pay for the care. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, but again, it's worth looking at. But, you know, I would still say the vast majority of people don't have long-term care insurance, and that's okay. I mean, so if you don't have it, I mean, I, I wouldn't, um, I don't think that's anything to much. panic about. Um, if it's a wonderful tool, it's worth looking at. Um, but there may be other options, you know, in, in the form of self-insurance, or you might be closer to whether it's a, a government benefit from a VA benefits or Medicaid. To assist with care. There are other options. Well, let's get uh, back in a little bit to the capacity and understanding the finances here. And I'm going to share my screen and pull up that slide. Um, before we do, we have one more question uh, from Mr. Lorenzo Brown. Are the long-term care policies a certain amount of coverage like life insurance policies? You know, what? I think we're going to do just like a long-term care insurance broadcast in the future. Wonderful idea. Um, I think it. I think it would be good. There's plenty of experts out there who can really d dive in. But that's a great question. There are. They offer it. It's um, and it's what makes it confusing because I was reviewing a policy just the other day for a client. When you're looking at them. They have bells and whistles, much like an automobile. You know, you buy a new automobile. It does this. It does that. It's got this switch and that switch and this feature. All insurance policies are the same way, and for consumers, that can make it pretty difficult. But there are things like it'll pay, you know, there's things like elimination period. It won't start paying benefits for 90 days. You have to be disabled at least 90 days or 120 days or a certain amount of time. 
um, there is a maximum benefit per year it will pay. Um, sometimes they might, you might see something like 100, it'll pay $150 a day towards nursing home. And that's sort of what they consider the average cost. And then you wanna make sure, do you have an inflation rider on that? Because $150 today, when you buy the policy, might not cover you, you know, in 20 years when you need that policy. So little things like that. And usually there's a maximum benefit period of four to five years, which is usually okay. Because if we end up in the nursing home, it's very rare that we may be there over four to five years. Very rare. If, and if so, Medicaid can pick it up. But, uh, but there are those little bells and whistles, I would call it. And sometimes you might um, interest, I mean, at least with the old policies, we used to be able to do this. You might say, well, $150 a day is great, but that's too expensive. How much would it cost me to get a, a long-term care policy that gives me $75 a day of benefit? And so you could reduce your cost by switching some of those, pulling some of those levers. You know, you might say, my goal is to stay at home and maybe I want some assistance with at-home care. So can I do this in such a way? Well, I'll get a benefit that'll cover some at-home care or some sitters or, you know, $75 a day. I don't need the full nursing home because that's not my intent. It's kind of like a cafeteria style where you can put whatever you want yes. on that policy. Uh, it is. And that's the insurance agents. That's what they do. And that's what a good insurance provider will do. We'll look at what your need is. We'll look at really what you can afford and we'll help try to design. That's a good way to talk about it. Like design an insurance product that meets those two needs. Now, that's that's we've, gotten, now that we've gotten into it more, I'm going to reach out to um, an insurance company. And maybe Jack, uh, we can talk after if you have someone that uh, you think would be good to bring on. And we'll kind of dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, insurance in general, whether it's, you know, you can even tie it in life insurance, long-term care insurance. And nowadays with those hybrid policies, they all mix together. They all, they're, 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 they're all convoluted. And, and I think that could be to all of our advantages. Because um, mm -hmm. insurance is, it, to me, it's just another tool for us, it, like in any area of life. It allows you to sleep a little bit better at night. It allows me to sleep a little bit better. At it night. does. It's like, you know, much like when we finally added the teenage driver to the car insurance no, as soon as we possibly could, you felt better <laughs> when the teenage driver went out in the world, you just felt safer. Um, and so it, insurance is a good thing. Okay. Let's get back into capacity and finances here. Yeah. And I, I like this slide because it really, if, if somebody kind of comes to me with an elder law question or, you know, concerns or thoughts, you know, I basically tell folks, before we get started or do anything else, there's just really two essentials. You, I believe you have to do um, if you're going to undertake, you know, elder law planning anytime in the future. Number one is a robust and updated durable power of attorney. And I know many, you know, I've talked about that before. You've heard about that. A durable power of attorney is really a legal document where you delegate the authority to do anything that you can do to someone else called an agent. And so why this is so important is if you become incapacitated, no longer can anyone do anything for you unless there's a durable power of attorney in place. The alternative is to go to court, which is costly and cumbersome, takes forever. Um, so a power of attorney, someone can act for you instantly because they have the document in hand. And so I say robust, and this is important. This is maybe a good takeaway is robust mean is is it powerful enough? You know, does my durable power of attorney allow me to do what I need to, my agent to do what they need to do? I have been involved in so many situations where, and we'll talk about it later, we needed to create a trust for somebody's elder law planning. Maybe we needed to transfer their home to the trust so that we could protect it for the disabled adult child. Because they did not have a power of attorney that had the requisite powers, we were unable to do that immediately, had a significant delay and had to do it through a court proceeding. And so there are, even if you go online and you get a form power of attorney, we have basic powers such as, you know, pay my bills and sell my home, sell my property. There's an alternative section and it's a, it basically calls it the special powers and it's the power to create a trust. It's the power to gift. It's the power to do all these advanced elder law things that we want to do. Unless you initial or sign that specifically, your agent does not have that power. And what I find is that most people on those forms do not 
select the superpowers. And in a way, I get it. it you know, it kind of makes sense. You don't want your agent to have too much power. And I think that's certainly okay early on or when you're younger. You know, in that case, it's not really as necessary. But when you get older, I think, at least my personal opinion, it's better to have more ro a more robust power of attorney to do what we need to do when we need to do it. Yeah, it kind of sounds like going all the way through that race, but at the last minute, not crossing the finish line by getting those extra check marks on there as you get older. It is, or at least initially that and, and giving that extra authority because, you know, and many of you have, you know, probably know about the Alabama Family Trust. It's a great tool for the benefit of our, just, our loved ones with special needs. Uh, it allows us to put assets in there to care for somebody and let them qualify for Medicaid. Well, that same trust can be used for somebody who's elderly trying to qualify for Medicaid in the nursing home. Still a payback trust, but you could take some money from your mom's name, put it into an Alabama family trust for her account. Trust is available for her additional care needs, and she's not, that money no longer counts against her for eligibility purposes, and it's not a transfer penalty. So it's a good thing. The point I'm making with the robust power of attorney is if your mother has no capacity, if she's unconscious because she had a stroke and she's in rehab now, we can't do that trust without going to court because your mother would be the one that would have to sign the trust agreement. Mm -hmm. If we had a power of attorney that allowed the creation of a trust and specifically an irrevocable trust, and we would recommend, you know, have a power of attorney that recommend that even specifically says irrevocable trust, trust of all type. Our form even rep, uh, even references the Alabama Family Trust by name. In, you know, we even say including the Alabama Family Trust because we want to make it clear that our agent has the authority to set up that account on behalf of their of their loved one who can no longer do it for themselves. So that's really the big takeaway. Hopefully, seeing the essential of this power of attorney. It really is the foundation potentially for all elder law planning. And most of the time, from my experience, if we're doing some planning for somebody who's particularly in a crisis mode, they can no longer sign anything. Um, and so we need to have somebody to act for them in that case. And, I love and that example that. that you just gave of someone being in capacity at the last minute, maybe having a stroke, going into rehab, and the need to have that durable power of attorney um, so that you can set up the trust and they can receive uh, federal and state benefits. Uh, in, in where they are, and it doesn't affect their assets. And it doesn't. And you know, you, you'll get, you can get there eventually, but when you have to turn to the court system, it, it, it's just, it's, at best, it's going to be, you know, you know, a month or two delay. That's just going to take a while. And when I'm, if I'm counseling somebody who's trying to do this and, thus, and they're, they're incapacitated and they have a power of attorney, you know, I'll ask for a copy and I'll be scanning it like, you know, and basically telling myself, please have that power. Please have that power. Please. And sometimes it'll be like, yes, okay, they do. We're good. It's safe. It's in there. And sometimes we're not, you know, sometimes we're disappointed because it's not in there. And that's an important thing to remember. Once the grantor of that power, once the person who signed that power of attorney loses capacity, that's it. That's, that's the last, that, unless they regain capacity, which is very rare, that's the last power of attorney that they'll do. And so you have to, and, and, you know, I think I told somebody recently, well, that's the power of attorney we got. We're going to do our best to work with it. You know, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's, and it's certainly better than nothing. I'd rather have a imperfect power of attorney than none at all, but we're very limited. Our hands are somewhat tied um, by the document because it, it tells us what we can do and we want to make sure we can do what we need to do. That's maybe the best way to say it. Now you're making me want to go back because I have a power of attorney for an older family member of myself. And I'm wondering if we have those check marks there. There you go. Double uh, check. Robust. You, That's what you right. do. Yeah. Um, and let's jump back into the PowerPoint presentation here and talk a little bit about understanding the financials. Yeah. And that's number two. Um, number two, you know, number one, get the authority to act. Number two in elder law is get a firm understanding of financials. And this is where we can all help out people that come after us by keeping a good personal financial record. And, you know, I, I will tell people, most elder law attorneys can do this. I mean, if somebody says, well, what do I do about finances? Or how do I, do I need to do any planning? Um, I can usually tell people what planning they probably need to do by just seeing a complete financial picture. Hmm. You know, if you could show me 
all the assets and how much, you know, I'll be able to say, okay, you're not eligible for this, but you're eligible for that. Or maybe you might want to consider doing X, X, Y, or Z or some options. I really can't go there at all until I see a complete financial picture. And this is something where we can really help our family members by, I'm talking, you know, there's plenty of forms and checklists. We have a family record book on our Carney Die website. You can download it and it has information to fill out financial information. And so, you know, I would, you fill out every home, how much is it worth? Is there a mortgage? Every retirement account, um, every bank account, every CD, um, everything you can possibly think of. One of the trickiest things out there are, the, are life insurance policies. Um, these have tripped up so many people on a Medicaid application because Medicaid will exempt a life insurance policy, but only to a very small degree, very small amount. So if you might, you know, well, I see a lot of folks like my parents' age and elderly folks, they have these little $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 policies, all permanent, that were purchased over the years. Those, you need to have a good handle on those. You need to see if they're still in effect, you know, what the value is, where they are. Um, I've helped clients before where, you know, mom's unconscious and we found a policy from the 40s and we didn't know if it was still effective. And so we basically got to do some detective work to try to figure out, okay, did somebody buy this company who then bought that company and then this kind? And then, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to have mom ready to apply for Medicaid. And then Medicaid says, no, 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 that policy makes her ineligible because yeah. that's an asset and it's worth over the threshold. It's almost like being a PI there. You're kind of going through all that detective work. It is. It, it, it is a, uh, as someone told me this week that they are now a financial detective because they are trying to care for an elderly loved one. And if you think about it, and I, you know, I think about this too, as, as a practitioner, if I am unconscious suddenly, does, does somebody know where everything is that they need to know, or even where I bank or, you know, and these are, this is a good exercise for you to do regardless of whether you're going to need long-term care because if you're incapacitated, you don't want to be um, like I had to help a client once where we were calling every bank in town, giving them her social security number and asking if there's an account. Yeah. And that's how we found an account. I mean, I mean, we, we, we would have gotten it eventually, I hope, from tax records and, you know, from checking mail, but we needed to know immediately where it was. So we were just and that takes a lot of time and energy. Whereas we can really serve our families well and our children well and our caregivers well by just preparing that. I would not recommend sharing that with anybody now, but I would recommend preparing it and keeping it somewhere in a safe location with your important documents. So think about it like a handbook. If I had to jump in and start taking care of this person, what do I need to know about their finances? Who's their insurance agent? You know, they, they have a disability policy. If they become disabled, who do I call? And what's the policy number? All those little things. Um, you can find, a, again, our personal record book, any personal record book, you could Google that online. There's countless templates that you could fill in. It's anything you'd want to know if you're an agent or an executor or something. I had a story once where we did, um, I did planning for somebody's elderly aunt and she filled out a little paperwork, listed her assets for me. I kept it in the file. Um, you know, probably about six months after we did the planning, she had a stroke and was unconscious. And her nephew, who knew me, called me and said, hey, do you still have that paper she filled out? Because I don't know anything about her finances, and I need to start paying bills. <laughs> and so fortunately, I had her little hand-scrawled notes. I was able to share it with him, and it gave him a starting point. He at least knew where to start. Yeah. You know, because he had, and again, it struck me as all of a sudden crisis hit, there's stress, He's, he doesn't know where to go or how to even start. And so by doing that, so those two things, give somebody the authority to act for you and then give them the information to act because that's so important. And, and when you're chasing information or playing financial detective or going through people's boxes in their house, looking for important paperwork, you're really wasting a lot of time that we need to get to take care of you. You know, lots, lots, uh, clock's ticking. Those are the two uh, pillars that kind of are the groundwork for elder law. That's a good way to say it. Uh, and then understanding the financials. And a lot of people don't like to speak about the financials. Um, they're a little reserved about it. But I can say when my family member, my grandfather passed away, 
we had a manila envelope um, and he'd take me through that, uh, the finances, what needed to happen. I didn't like how he labeled it. He said for, he labeled it as, as like after I die yeah, kind of thing. So I don't <laughs> recommend labeling it like that, but it was a huge help for me. Um, and the resources that you guys have, we'll put a link of that financial form. Yeah. I will, sure. uh, I'd say the resources on your guys' website are awesome. Um, when we had the conversation with Jennifer um, last month, she mentioned a resource that actually uh, I'm going to use in my personal life is just kind of making sure that me and uh, you know, the person that I'm with are on the same page about uh, what does it look like for paying for full education or half of education. I think these are great questions and resources mm -hmm. that you guys have. Um, and, and so we'll go ahead and post those links there. I think, I think letters of intent is that, and, that's, and that, that can go hand in hand with elder law too. I think more and more we've had clients and I think this is so important Oftentimes we don't know what our family wants, or they say some things and our memory, you know how faulty our memories can be. Um, if you have specific wishes about your care, I think it's wonderful to write those down and say, this is generally what I want. And, you know, I've had clients that have written addendums to their advanced healthcare directive, or maybe a separate letter. I want to stay at home for as long as possible. I had a client once that wanted to write, wanted to give his family a budget for his long-term care. He's like, here's my net worth. I want you to spend this amount of long-term care and then that's it. <laughs> <You know>, so, <laughs> then let me go. Then let me go. I don't know if you could do that, but he, but I, I appreciated his um, his effort there. And I appreciated it, that to the family because I could see what, what kind of comfort that is for people to know general wishes. Okay, we've got this money to take, much money to take care of dad. We can take pretty good care of him. And he wants us to spend this amount. You know, otherwise, then you could have, you know, disputes among family members about levels of care or what's appropriate or no. I see it all the time, unfortunately, in elder law and, you know, folks, everybody means well, but everybody's got different ideas of what's right for mom or dad. And no, she no, needs to go here. No, needs to go there. No, needs to go over here. And that can obviously be quite emotional. And it may not be what they wanted. The parents wanted in the beginning. Yeah, a lot of times mom or dad is the last person to get asked what they want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's exactly. my job to make sure we say, well, let's ask your mom what she wants to do. Or that's our job now, as I just mentioned, to write that down and mm -hmm. say that, you know, this is what I want. Here's the plan and here's who's in charge. That's the other advantage of the power of attorney. If you have a child or you're afraid, you know, even jokingly, you know, oh, they're going to put me in a nursing home or they said they're going to put you in a nursing home. Maybe you don't name them to make decisions. Maybe you name <laughs> somebody else. So those are some considerations to think about. Yeah. And it can be chaos, like you said, when, it, when something happens and this provides that pathway for them. Uh, having, a, having a plan. That's kind of, I think that's kind of the whole the, the theme. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the eligibility for some of this financial help from the state. Sure. That's a great transition. I think there's a lot of myths in this area and that's kind of what I like about this opportunity to, to share some information on it and some basic rules and, you know, as we talked about before, um, nursing home, if, if, if it's catastrophic and I need nursing home care, if my financial eligibility reaches a certain point, Medicaid will cover that care. And one of the things I want to talk about is dispel the myth that Medicare will pay for nursing home care. Mm. Medicare is what you get automatically when you're a senior, or it's what you get when you receive Social Security disability income. SSDI, Medicare, it is basically designed for healthcare. And there are some times when you might end up in a rehab hospital that Medicare does cover. Medicare has some limited coverage, but it's limited to a certain number of days. And those days are designed to get you from the hospital, rehab, get you back home or out in the community or somewhere else. So Medicare will cover, but it's very limited. Medicaid is needs-based, and that's what covers the cost of nursing home care. And if we talk about qualifying, you know, there's some great uh, resources on Alabama Medicaid site. They have a good handout about Medicaid and qualifying. There's exempt assets and there's non-exempt assets. Exempt assets are basically things, I'll talk about it in the next slide, home, car. Very similar if we're talking about SSI and Medicaid for maybe a young person who has special needs. Same basic exempt assets. Non-exempt assets are everything else over two thousand dollars. Two thousand dollar figure is the same as it's it is. Cut off. 
as the cutoff is not a lot. And that includes 401k and IRA and retirement as all countable. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is transfers. I think everybody now knows about the five-year rule. I mean, when people come to see me, they know everybody kind of has this feeling out there that there's a transfer penalty. That for Medicaid purposes, I cannot, if I want to qualify for Medicaid and I have too much money, there are rules that prevent me from dumping that money at the last minute and then qualifying for Medicaid. The rule that prevents that is what we call the five-year rule. And so when you go to apply for Medicaid, Medicaid is going to look at the date of application and they're going to look at every transaction you made for the previous five years. And they're going to look for transfers that you made uh, that were gifts, not for value is what we call it. And so talk a little bit about exemptions to transfers. You know, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty harsh rule, um, but there are some exemptions. So if you, if you make a transfer to pay for something that you're getting in return, that is a transfer for value. That doesn't count. So one example would be uh, a caregiver agreement. You know, if you, and if, if you're a child taking care of an elderly parent and they give you $100 a week, but you have no agreement, Medicaid is going to count that as a transfer that'll lead to some disqualification later when you talk about how that works. However, if you have a caregiver agreement that's official legal document and they're paying you $100 pursuant to that agreement, that is not a transfer subject to the five-year rule. That's a transfer for value because they're giving you $100 and you're presumably giving them $100 of service. So it's even. So it's a good example would be um, in doing a Medicaid application, there's like a $500, $600 check Medicaid found from three years ago made out to an individual. Who's Jim Smith? Why'd you pay him this check? So I had to go back to the client. Who's Jim Smith? Oh, he fixed our roof. I told Medicaid, oh, he fixed their roof. And they're like, well, we need proof. We need an invoice that Jim Smith fixed the roof for $600. So it was that level of scrutiny. Yeah, it's you, like getting audited. It really, it, it really is. It's a, and, and to the extent you know that you can, um, and I'll talk about this, some tips, if we ever might apply. There, I think there's some good tips we, could, we can all think about if this ever comes. But they, I, I bring that up to show that they're really looking for that transfer for value. And, and, and another, there's some exemptions I'm gonna talk about in a minute um, that are important for this community. Uh, but you know, sometimes people say, well, Jack, isn't there a rule that I can give $10,000 away to whoever I want? And, and a lot of people think that applies for Medicaid and it does not. Mm -hmm. That's one good thing. That is a gift tax rule that's related to the federal death tax, the estate tax. And it's not, it's the old $10,000. Inflation has now adjusted it to $15,000. And so for estate tax purposes, you can give $15,000 a year to as many people as you want, and you don't have to file a gift tax return. Those are things left for the ultra high net worth folks out there. You know, most of us, myself included, don't worry about gift tax return. <laughs> I wish I was worried about it. Exactly. It, but I, I say that to say that there is no such monetary exemption for Medicaid. Um, if you make a transfer, you make a transfer. You know, there are some exceptions and you just got to be careful with it where if, you know, my grandmother, for example, used to give me $25 or something, 20 bucks every birthday. That's not a transfer for this purpose. Yeah. If it's a regular, and it's a de minimis amount. Now, if my grandmother was about to go to the nursing home and I said, oh, she usually gives me five grand every birthday. Well, unless she's been doing that for a decade, a decade or so, I wouldn't even try to get that past me. <laughs> you know, if you have a history, maybe. But again, we got to think about what they're looking at. They're, they're looking hard at assets. And does this person or should this person have sufficient assets to pay for their own care? I didn't know about the five-year rule. This is something totally new to me. Um, and that's, it makes sense. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to be able to dump all of your assets in to other person's hands or, or stuff like that and then receive a bunch of money from the federal and state it, government. It is. And I think it's a good thing, Alex. I mean, and I think especially for the special needs community, a lot of times... If you have folks able to do that, that takes away from Medicaid, maybe from folks who really need it because they can't work and accumulate. Yeah. You know, there is a community out there that really depends on Medicaid services because they have no other options. And so I, I look at it as it, it, it is a good thing. It's a good thing to be aware of. And, um, and, and just know that there is a consequence to making those transfers. And, and that's part of what I think kind of doubling back to elder law is, Whenever we talk about making a transfer, 
there's tax consequences, there's Medicaid consequences, there's legal consequences. All of those things are what we consider and look at before we make a decision. So in the case of, let's say you set up a trust and you transfer a majority of your assets into that trust within that five years, Medicaid's gonna look at that and say that's not exempt? Well, what they'll do, and we'll, we'll get to the, how they calculate it, you, it could go to a certain trust, um, an irrevocable trust, and as, but five years has to go by. Mm. So it has to be to a trust that's not countable. And, and, and the downside of that is you have to give up complete control when you send it away to this trust. So yeah, you have to truly give it away. And as long as five years passes, there's no worry, there's no problem, as long as that's to a, a the right kind of trust mm -hmm. but the way they calculate the penalty period and we, we can we can we'll cover it um it's a certain way when we talk about what this penalty means and, okay. and how the five-year rule works in reality uh we'll hold off on that until we get yeah. to the side and um am i thinking about i always thought medicaid was federal and medicare was more state am i right in that thinking you're totally off it, it's it's probably the other way around if anything okay. <laughs> it's probably the other, you probably have it just reversed and I, you know, it's it's one of those things that they, the state's involved with both, but really, you know, they're both federal dollars. There might be some, there's some state contributions. They're both federal dollars. Uh, but really, these states, particularly on Medicaid, because Medicare is more of an entitlement. If you reach this age, you get it. If you get disability, you get it. You know, this type of disability, I should say. Um, so it's kind of, it's a lot easier. Medicaid is, is needs-based, and so there's a lot more, um, you know, state involvement, and the federal government basically gives the states the money. They give them some basic rules. You basically have to do this, and then they let them make their own rules underneath the basic rule umbrella. Kind of like the education system. So you'll see some, yeah, you'll see some different varieties, but Medicaid is, is primarily administered by the state, and that's why you see a lot of things, and I don't, I don't know much about it, but you know, Medicaid expansion and are the states going to do it or not? And they have to adopt these certain things in order to get the extra federal dollars and do things certain ways. And so states can elect to do certain things. And the federal government, much, you know, much like education, controls you with your, their dollars. Mm. Give you the money if you do it this way. Yeah, we're going to test you. Yeah. Standardized testing kind of a thing. Let's Absolutely. get back to the... Um, yeah. The PowerPoint here and talk about some of those exemptions that we're kind of I do yeah and this is just important there's um there's exemptions when we're talking about countable assets of a home you, your your house is exempt when you go to apply your automobile life insurance I think it's five thousand dollars of life insurance um, you can have a burial policy that relates to the life insurance exemption and then you can have personal property you know just your stuff Mm -hmm. um, and then no more than $2,000 in order to be eligible. So if you're a person that just owns a home, and we'll talk about this with some examples, if you just own a home and you only have $1,000 in the bank, you are eligible to apply for Medicaid. You meet the standard. The home is not counted. Now, Medicaid may put a lien on that home unless there's an exemption to that. You know, they may try to get paid back later, but they're not going to take your home. Mm -hmm. nor is the nursing home going to take your home. I think I hear that a lot. People are like, I don't want the nursing home to take my home. You know, and they won't. Um, what they might do is they might deny coverage um, or they might, the Medicaid, not the nursing home, will lien the home to get repaid later. It's much like a payback trust for, for you know, special needs trust purposes. Yeah, it's taking, like, like taking out a loan on your home kind of thing. It really is to say, you know, it is exam. And there's certain ways to get that lien lifted and it whole nother world. Um, but for these purposes, that's what makes you eligible. And there are certain transfers, as I mentioned one before, a transfer for consideration. If you get, if you if you get a good and service in return, that's not a non that's not a transfer subject to penalty. There are some transfers for children, and there's one for a disabled child exemption. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in examples, where any assets, including the home that's distributed to a disabled child or to a trust for the benefit of that disabled child, for the sole benefit, I should say, is not a penalized transfer. And that's an important thing to remember. You know, it's you, there are options to protect assets and the home for a disabled adult child. And I think it, it makes such practical sense that this is in place 
because if you have someone, if you have a child living with you and they're an adult, you know, maybe a child in their 50s and you're in your 80s and you have to go to a nursing home, you can't have Medicaid lean that home. Your child needs a place to stay. Yeah. And so there are exemptions for that. There's also an interesting caregiver child exemption. Most people don't realize about this. Um, if you move, if, if a child moves into the home uh, and provides care for two years prior to the date of nursing home admission, you can give that home to that child without penalty. Huh. So it, it requires some forethought. It requires some evidence that the care that you actually have to live there. And then you actually have to provide care that's keeping your parent from the nursing home. Gotcha. So you have to you have to show that you being there for two years enabled that family member to stay within the home, and that right. effectively is less uh, cost for the government. It's saving. You know, if you look at the policy behind it, it's let's encourage this so that it saves us money. And then if they do it, we'll give them a carrot at the end. You can take the home. Yeah. You know, you're gonna you get a prize if you if you make it. Um, and so, but it's important to just know that those, uh, that those, especially those two exemptions, especially the disabled child exemption. Um, and I get this question a lot. It's not disabled grandchild or disabled niece or nephew. It's disabled child. So there, that is a limitation. It cannot, it does not apply. I've had clients that have been the caregiver for a disabled grandchild and it does not apply. It's what about the, uh, the caregiver child? Can that be a caregiver grandchild or it has to be child? Caregiver child. Yeah, it has to be a caregiver child. And so it's just the way the statute is worded, the regulations are worded, they're very, you know, they're very strictly interpreted. It says child. And so we've run into that before with folks where everybody's family is different. So it's just something to, you know, there may be other options um, in those areas, but very important to know those are in existence. And yeah, and and we'll we'll talk more about it with some examples and you know how how does it really work. Let's go over the five-year rule. Yeah, this is this is important. You know, I, I want to make sure that folks realize that you're not, you know, you're not prevented from applying for Medicaid for five years, not at all. Uh, but, you know, five years, how, how this works, I basically try to lay it out here. They'll look at all your transfers and they'll add them up. You know, so they'll, you know, they'll they'll add up the transfers. Let's say it's sixty thousand dollars you made over the last five years, and you can't tell them where it went. Um, then, so what they'll do is they'll take the average nursing home care in Alabama. It's a little higher than this, but it's between six and seven thousand dollars. At least it has been recently. They'll say the average cost of care is six thousand dollars. We're going to divide the amount of your transfers by the cost, average cost of monthly care. We're going to come up with a number, and that's the number of months of care you could have paid for if you didn't give that money away. Therefore, so you think I like to think about it practically. Therefore. You, we are not going to pay for 10 months. Yeah. You know, starting today, you're on your own. You have to get it from the kids. Obviously, the, the recipient themselves cannot have money because you can't apply for Medicaid until you're eligible, if that makes sense. Can't apply until you're eligible. So there's a penalty period you have to serve um, in that case. And so, you know, there's some planning techniques out there in crisis planning where actually folks will trigger the penalty on purpose. You know, if they, if they feel like they need to preserve some money, they might get, you know, give money away, put some money in the Alabama Family Trust so it's not countable, apply for Medicaid, get triggered a penalty, serve their time, and then get on Medicaid. Yeah, that's huge. That's kind of working the system there. It's working the system, Mel. Yes, it is. And, and you know, it, it's, I look at it, if there's a, if there's a reason to do it, you know, and maybe it's something like that. You're trying to preserve money for a disabled grandchild. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you don't have the exceptions. Maybe you have to do some of this aggressive planning because if you truly run out of your own money, this person's in trouble. Yeah. So I, I bring that up to say there are options, but you're right. Triggering penalties and doing some of those things, uh, it, it's doable, but uh, it, it's also very complicated too. And it's kind of playing uh, dirty and almost like, is it worth the effort? Uh, it is. I think there's smarter, you know, and there's some better things to do. There's like, there's spend down, there's, you know, putting money into your house, there's prepaying for funeral, you know, there's putting some money in the family trust. I mean, there's paying a caregiver child. I mean, there, there's a lot you can do before that. But the key, I guess I want folks to know on the five-year rule is it's a penalty period. And here's the most important part. You have to be careful when you apply, because if you apply one day too early, 
you you know, say you made a transfer four years, 11 months ago, you know, 29 days ago, and then you apply yeah. for Medicaid, you were penalized. If you would have waited one day, free and clear. Yeah, and uh, that could be 10 months. Like it, could, it could be, it could be 10 months. It could be years, depending on how big that transfer was. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is, premature, that's what's kind of worries me about Medicaid applications, a premature application. So I would always like to see what do people have in their history? And there are folks who say, you know what? And they didn't, they didn't do it for Medicaid reasons. They're like, you know, years ago, I gave them a home to my kids because I didn't need it anymore. I just gifted it to them. That's a transfer penalty. Transfer. That is a gift. Even though it's an exempt asset, when you take that exempt asset and you gift it, that is a penalty for the five-year rule purpose. So if that mother gave her home to the kids, let's say four years ago, my advice would be before you apply for Medicaid, try to do whatever you can to, to wait one more year, like scrape money together from whatever source, you know, get, uh, and, and what ends up happening sometimes, and I think they do a good job with it. And I think they're essential is nursing homes will apply for Medicaid mm -hmm. because nursing homes like to get paid. Yeah. So they'll, want, they'll want to apply and they'll apply sometimes quickly. And maybe one of the keys we can do as family members is to say, whoa, 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 let's, let me, let me, let me look at this. Uh, let me make sure this is right. Let me have someone look at this and work with you. Or, or, or are you sure you covered all the transfers or mom gave the home away? You know, we sure that's accounted for. And you're sharing a lot of great tips here. I want to share this um, PowerPoint that you put together uh, with some tips to repair for long-term care. Oh, yeah. And this is just some kind of um, some takeaways. I know we don't want to wrap it up on time, but obviously get a power of attorney. I think that's hands down, you know, step one, step one, get an updated, good power of attorney. Um, maintain that summary of financial assets. I mean, I think that's a good thing for all of us to do anyway, is to have a good understanding of where we stand, where we're going, where we've been financially. Um, see, do not transfer assets without legal guidance. I mean, again, there are times when folks come in and they'll say, Jack, I just, I need you to put mom's home in our name. You know, deed the home to us. And cause that's what I heard you need to do. And you know, that's, and, and I, I, you know, and I see, so, you know, okay, well let's, let's just talk through that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a big deal to give your home away. Yeah. So for so, a lot of people, that's uh, the biggest thing that you ever purchase. Well, and it's your security, it's your dignity, and there might be unforeseen consequences. So there are other options, you know, let's talk, we, there are other options we can, you know, and that's maybe for another day of ways to protect the home. You could do something called a life estate deed where you keep the home, but you, at your death, it passes to your kids. You know, if anybody wants to Google that, there's some information out there. Um, that has pros and cons as well, but I'm usually not a big fan of giving the home because number one, the home is an exempt asset. You can still get Medicaid. If you give the home, you've created a transfer subject to the five-year rules. Yeah. Uh, number two concern taxes. Um, this has been, we're going to do a newsletter article soon on stepped up basis. When you give somebody a home, they take your basis, meaning what you paid for it. And if they later sell it, they have to recognize capital gain on the difference. Yep. If you die and leave somebody your home in a will under current law, it may change. The basis steps up to the date of death value. So your kids could sell your home with no tax issues. Yeah. You also lose your homestead exemption. You know, many of people who have gifted the home will wonder why their property tax bill is now thousands of dollars. Well, you don't, it's not your residence anymore. You gifted it. It's treated like rental property. Yeah. And then so just those unforeseen. And then lastly, when you give a home to somebody, you know, not in a trust with any accountability. I think it's risky because if, if your child owns your home, their creditors could attach to your home. If they get divorced, your home could be subject to the divorce proceeding mm -hmm. and be subject to division. So just some of those risks of why I say, you know, without maybe without going in eyes wide open, maybe we could say that about what the consequences are. Yeah, because I can imagine being at the house and then, you know, having like your son or your daughter and their significant other having a crazy fight and then they get divorced and now you're not sure where to go because they got to you got to sell the house. You do, or it might be such a division. And really, what you're, um, you know, and I, Alex, I was at, um, I think I was handling a pro bono case or something in divorce court once. In the case before us, they were, I was talking to lawyers about it. They were arguing over mom's house. 
and they were in a tight spot, the husband was, because he was trying to say that's not a house subject to the divorce because that's his mom's house. But mom gave him the house so they could protect it from Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So he either had, I mean, he couldn't win. If he said it's not a real transfer, he has a problem with Medicaid. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a sticky situation? It's really mom's house. You're, you're, you're flirting with Medicaid fraud. It's not really mom's house. It's your house. But if you say it's your house, your soon to be X is going to take half of it, or at least that value of it. Yeah. So it was a it was a tough situation that could have been avoided maybe with a little more thoughtful care or planning of care. And, you know, again, if the concern is, and I'm a big believer of, if you have the family property that's been in the house in the family for three generations and it's important to preserve it, I think you should. Yeah. I think you should take steps, and there are steps you can do to do that where it does not have to be attached by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Um finish up quickly, you know, um, limit the amount of financial accounts. What I mean by that is if you ever have to apply for Medicaid, and this is not a bad idea just to keep up with stuff anyway, you have to give Medicaid bank statements for every account you have for the previous five years. So if you're a person that might have six different bank accounts, which I've seen a lot of folks have more than I thought, um, <laughs> there you go. You're going to have to give statements from all those institutions. If you know, and so consolidation, you know, getting down to two maybe, or you know, a lot of times our some of our clients have they've getting they've gotten CDs at different banks, you know, yep. different yep. rates here, different rate there. I go to this bank, and that requires you to open an account and you keep a little bit of money in it, and and that gets really cumbersome for your caregivers later when they're trying to figure out what you own, and it also gets cumbersome for Medicaid. So. Just thinking ahead, that's a reason to consolidate. Um, utilize check images. You know, something that's kind of checks I know are going away, but I would always prefer it if somebody's, especially making a, a certain types of payments, that it's on a check with a memo line filled out. That yep. helps for Medicaid purposes. Um, I had a client once that, um, this wasn't for Medicaid, she was being questioned about her care for her mom, like whether, whether she was doing a good job. And her mom did probably operated like my grandmother would have. It was always with cash. cash. And so she, her mom would tell her to go to the ATM every week and take out $500 for groceries, expenses, whatever. Well, when mom could no longer speak for herself, all we had was a record of this person getting cash once a week. Yeah. With no receipts. And it's not that it's bad. It just looks bad. Looks bad. Exactly. I don't believe it was bad at all because I could totally see some, you know, my own family telling me to do that. But even if you do do that, receipts, of course, are important, and that helps for Medicaid, because what Medicaid's going to say in that situation, if it were needed, well, you just made a weekly transfer. You were dumping 500, you know, they think, they assume the worst, so yeah. job. You were trying to dump your assets by giving this person $500. We don't know what she spent it on. Mm -hmm. So credit cards, financial records, debit cards, something that shows us what that's for. Um, I limit the use of cash for large purposes. And then I mentioned before, don't, you don't want to apply for Medicaid prematurely. You know, it, it just might be waiting a week. You know, I, and personally, I like to throw in a few extra days just for fun, just, <laughs> just, just in case. It's like that uh, when the purchase goes through versus what it posted to the account. It's like, we're going to wait a few more exactly. days. Exactly, same thing. <laughs> just, you know, just if we can, just in case, because we just, it could be catastrophic to get slammed with a penalty that you didn't realize was early on in that account. So it's looking at those statements and doing that. Yeah, I mean, that's gotta, I would feel so mad at myself just for like a week and it making a big difference on you know, either my care or some family member's care. Yep, so. Let's, um, awesome. and you guys always do great. Every time we have you guys on, you guys give great examples. And I think the audience really, enjoys those examples and you provided a few case studies here. So I'd like Good. to Good, yeah, and very brief. Um, just trying to throw a few ideas out there, just mainly illustrating some of the rules. And some of these are things we've really dealt with. Um, this is one mom lived with disabled adult daughter. Mom was in the nursing home. She could not go home. It was very expensive. All of her assets were at, were at threat of being spent down, which meant her daughter, who was on a small disability payment, would have nothing yeah. and would have no place to live. And so this was a case where mom did not have a power of attorney that was sufficient. It did not have the power we needed. So we had to go to court to get this authorized. And we did. It just took a lot longer. It was a little more expensive. But mom was able to transfer the home, or really mom through the court, transferred the home 
to her daughter and place $300,000 into a sole benefit trust. That's the term we use. It says it has to be for the sole benefit of a disabled child. She immediately, mom immediately qualified for Medicaid. Medicaid immediately approved that whole transaction. And mom's income, which was my modest, went to the nursing home and Medicaid made up the difference. The good thing is this daughter was able to keep her home and was able to keep this money in trust with the help of a trustee to take care of her needs. It, it was a great situation. One thing I do want to point out, this is where elder law gets, you know, gets complicated. That trust to the daughter is not a traditional, necessarily a traditional special needs trust. Mm -hmm. Because that daughter was on a disability payment that was not needs based. She was gotcha. claiming off her deceased father's retirement. So it was not needs-based disability. If it were needs-based disability, then that sole benefit trust would have counted as an asset. She would have lost her needs-based disability. And I haven't faced this issue yet, but I think there's some understanding that we could put that, there's some belief that we could put that into a D4A special needs trust and still qualify. Hmm. But basically though, sometimes when you're, when you're leaving something to a disabled adult child, you might have to sacrifice some eligibility. So yes, yeah, or at least look at that. But I mean, keeping the home for that child and that, that 300,000 of, of liquid asset is huge for the long-term success of that. Even if it was just the home, and the good thing about the home is, the home is, whether that daughter was on needs-based or not, home's exempt. Home's exempt for mom, home's exempt for her. Yeah. And even if she stayed in that house while mom was in the nursing home, even if mom did not transfer the home to her, she could have stayed there and it would have been not subject to lien. Mm. As long as so, you're staying in the house full time. As long as you're staying in the house. You have a disabled dependent staying in the house. If you have a spouse or a dependent staying in that house, it's not subject to lien. Mm. So I think those are some important um, considerations. Yeah, um, and that's awesome that you guys were able to step in and help that family because it could have gone a totally different way um, if you guys didn't have a relationship with them. Well, and that's what I think the key is to realize, like, what I would hate to see is somebody even trying to do the right thing and say, you know what, this is my money, I need to use it for my care first. That's the right thing to do. Well, I don't know if it is, because the law recognizes if you have a disabled dependent, that might not be the right thing. Set this money aside for their care, and then you can qualify for Medicaid. And, and from a public policy, Alex, I mean, if you look at it this way, uh, when you do that, if you think about it, whose care might be more expensive in the long term? I was just going to comment on that, yeah. <laughs> so, child. So they're basically saying, give the money to the person that might be more expensive for us. We'll take care of you Yeah. in your remaining years. And it makes sense. And so right. I, like to, I like to think about the sense behind it. It helps when you when you're looking at this. Um, and again, this next, just quickly, this next case study, kind of similar to what I talked about before. Um, if someone's been, even if they've been caring for their niece and they're in the home, if the aunt becomes ill and requires care, let's say she owns a home and has about $100,000 in countable assets, she would need to spend down to $2,000 before ever getting Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Now that home's protected, at least while she's alive, the only thing Medicaid can do is lean it, They'll place a lien on it uh, to get recovery. They call it Medicaid estate recovery. Get recovery after mom's death. Um, and they'll, they'll seek to, and they'll be able to. Um, but it's just a good example of, well, okay, mom has $100,000 in the accountable assets. Well, what can we do with it? Because she needs long-term care now. Well, it's a good time to talk about spend down. I would ask the question, you know, she have a prepaid burial and funeral plan. Maybe let's get that and make sure it's Medicaid compliant. Uh, there's certain rules about how much it can be and how it's written. Uh, you know, does, uh, you know, do we put some of that into the Alabama Family Trust? Do we take some of that money and put it into the AFT, which is a payback special needs trust, but it would allow aunt to qualify immediately for Medicaid. And that money in the Alabama Family Trust could be used for aunt's care only. So okay. it could supplement aunt's care. Can't be used for anybody else. Um, and there's some things like, um, you know, if she goes on Medicaid, that AFT money could be used to pay for a private room, or maybe it could be used to pay, pay for some social workers or people to help her and do different things. And so it's still a good thing, but it's 
it's worth thinking about, but that's more the crisis plan. But here we just, we don't have any disabled child exemption. That's the key. I got you. Now, um, I want to say again, the AFT, uh, if you pass away, that money stays in the AFT, correct? Doesn't go to family. Up to a point, it, it, up to the uh, Medicaid payback amount. So whatever yeah. it, Medicaid has paid for your behalf through your life, they get that first. The AFT keeps a portion by statute, small percentage they use for charitable purposes and they do something good things with it. If there's any left after that, then it goes to family. Gotcha. So it's very, it's probably unlikely it goes to family because if your Medicaid exceeds what's in the AFT, Medicaid does not get that difference from anybody else. They basically take what they can get. Yeah. Um, but it's still, it's a good tool. Um, this is one, to, you know, talking about our caregiver child exemption. If the son moves into the home three years ago to provide care and it kept him from the nursing home, then after he is admitted to the nursing home, he can transfer his home to his caregiver child. And sometimes I'll recommend to people who are contemplating this as a possibility, go ahead and start gathering information that number one, the son lived there for the time period. Mm -hmm. And this is because you can imagine, Alex, I mean, people like to, I mean, I think some people would try, well, if I check on my mom every day, that's kind of like I live there. No. You got to have mail coming, you know, bank Taxes, statements. mail, voting, register. I mean, you're, that's kind of the gold standard. Where are you registered to vote? What's that address on it? Where do you go vote? It needs to be at that address. Um, and you have to do that. And then number two, document it with a doctor as early as possible. And keep documenting it, that your care is helping. Mm -hmm. um, because when you get to that point, now there are, um, and there are other little um, exemptions, you know, there's an exemption on a home that it's interesting when you think about it. If you, if you inherited a home from your mom and dad, let's say I inherited the family property out in wherever, I don't have any family property, but if I did out in Jasper or whatever, but my sister moved in to that house because she didn't have a place to live, but my name's on the deed and then I need Medicaid. Medicaid is not going to hold that property against me as long as my sibling is living in it. So they, they, don't, they, they don't have to be special needs or anything, just a sibling. No, just a sibling. It's a sibling exemption from inherited property, but it has to be property you inherit from your mom and dad. You're, so you see what I mean? It's, it's interesting. The policy behind it is my name's on that property, but my sibling's living there. I have no real use of that property. Hmm. And the policymakers basically say, we don't want to force your sibling who probably needs a place to live to have to sell that home to pay for your care, to cut it in half. So we're going to let that go as long as your sibling is living in that house. If your sibling goes to sell that house, different story. Yeah, <laughs> well, then we want Medicaid, some of that. Medicaid is going to want a half piece of that. But it's just interesting. There are just those little nuances and so it, I always tell folks, it's just case by case. I mean, it's just kind of looking at every, that's why every individual situation, like every plan is, is, is so different. And you've got to dig into a little bit of those details. And that's part of, um, you know, what I would say this digging into your financial assets. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot my name's on the deed for mama's home. Uh, that's important to know so that that can be disclosed at any time in the future, or you could work it out now, you know, something, how are you going to, you know, there, are, I've seen situations where it could go wrong the other way. I mean, if, if the exemption doesn't apply and you own a home and someone else is living there, that could be a bad thing because mm -hmm. that could disqualify you a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, uh, now I feel like there are, um, how often do these minute, I won't say minute, but smaller rules change. I would say not too often in my experience. Um, I mean, they could, and I think the state regulatory agencies, they tweak them every once in a while. Yeah. The federal law gives some new guidance. And are you grandfathered in from previous laws if it does change? I think it just kind of depends on how the new law <laughs> says yeah. it. Not always, not always. I mean- Because that would be really frustrating if you went through all the process and everything looked 100% perfect and then a new yep. law came out. And it's like, well, that no longer applies. And it's like, well, what the heck? We did everything I think it's right. unlikely. I think it's unlikely because it's such good policy. But like the caregiver child, you're right. You can move in with dad for two years, give two years of your life. There is nothing that stops anybody from changing that law and saying, we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. 
you'd be out of luck. Uh, <laughs> that's, I just, I, that's life. This life, but I, I think, but the same, yeah, you, you spent two years with your dad. That's great. That's, that's, that's beneficial. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that's likely. I just don't. It's been around a while, and I think it's such good policy. And I think a lot of, and the other thing I noticed in the law, same with special needs trusts and planning, when so many people have relied on something, it's really hard to change it. Yeah, it becomes a staple yes. in the community. Kind it of thing. really does. And we've relied on this. And I think I like to think the policymakers, absent a drastic change, will take that into consideration. You know, if yeah. we change this, it's going to disrupt a lot. Like with any kind of tax planning or Medicaid planning, it's hard to not do more gradual changes. Yeah, you know, for example, we've seen, I think I've seen more changes in states, reading an article recently about a state recovery. Some states are trying to get more expansive in what they can recover. And if you think about it, a state recovery is a good place to have law changes because it really doesn't affect anybody. No, that's why you're is, alive. Is already gone. Yeah. Medicaid's already been paid for. Medicaid's just trying to see what they could get back. Yeah. So they're trying to be more aggressive in the estate recovery world. Hmm. I mean, I'd like to keep an eye on those. So yeah, it's interesting. It is. I was just thinking like how many documents you guys have to go through to keep up with all this and it's ever changing but, it, uh, it is and that's why again it's like this you know these elder law cases i mean again they can become you know i tell folks unfortunately you know folks might say well i just have a quick question on this elder law what should i do should i transfer this house to my my son well i'm gonna probably need about an hour and a half of your time <laughs> i'm gonna need a lot of financial information and I'm going to need a lot of personal health information. You see, as you notice, there's a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. And so quick answers are okay, or internet answers are okay, but I always say use caution because there's a, you know, there, there might be some unforeseen little, and that's why lawyers ask a lot of questions. We're ultimately, we're looking for that loophole, that little nugget, that little, that little fact scenario that doesn't mean much to you, but to us, it means everything. Yeah, your eyes kind of get bright. You're like, oh, I yeah, see oh, it now. We got it now. Yes, and I've, I've, I've done that. I mean, and I felt bad. Like, I, this person was fine, but we were talking about mom and her planning and just telling myself and had the three kids. And the, one of the daughters goes, well, I'm disabled. And I said, you are? That's great. <laughs> I said, oh, but I, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> oh, we can do a lot, of, a lot of things there for the family. It's like we have options and we have options to protect you. That's what I, you know, that's that, that, that uh, it's another card. Let's put it that way. It's another card. It's another tool we can use. Yeah. And just like going to your doctor, always tell the truth to your doctor, be upfront and everything. Yeah. Same with your lawyer and your attorneys. Well, I tell people that's why there's a privilege, you know, with your pastor, with your doctor and with your lawyer, there's certain rules of confidentiality that we can't break. And there's also a privilege that no one can force us to break it. So if you transferred something a few years ago, you don't want to tell me. It's, I always tell people it's important to tell me. Yeah. And I can't tell anybody. No one can even force me to tell anybody. That's why we have a privilege because the truth is so important in these situations. The full story. Let's go ahead uh, yeah, and do the, the fourth case study here. Yeah. I just um, something to think about um, special needs planning going the other way, maybe, <laughs> is um, – the daughter's drafting a will and she wants to leave money to her mother to help provide for her care. Let's say she's her sole caregiver and she's actually financially supporting her mom. If the assets pass out right to her mother, they could prevent mom from qualifying for Medicaid. And, and number two, you know, they could, mom might mismanage those assets. So there might be some concerns about that. So you could actually leave those to a special needs trust for mom's care, discretionary trust, would not disqualify mom from needs-based assistance and can provide for all of her care. So it's elder law, or, you know, again, that special needs planning the other way. Yeah. Is instead of taking care of our kids who might be in need, is if you want to leave something for a parent in a will. And I've done several like that. Where, and it's unlikely. Again, we have to recognize that too. What's likely, what's not. But, you know, somebody might say, you know what? If I died suddenly, my mother's going to need help. Yeah. And she's going to need care and she's going to need financial support. I'd like to leave this money to her. My recommendation would be to always leave it in a trust. Even, quite honestly, even if they're healthy. Because as they get older, the chances of needing it for long-term care purposes are going to keep increasing. Yeah. And they'll be so, able to do a lot more with that trust money um, 
as Medicaid and Medicare or Medicaid's paying for those other it keeps, And it keeps the options open. And I always tell folks, much like a special needs trust, just because you have a special needs trust does not mean you have to get Medicaid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just means it's now an option and options are good. You know, you might determine it's the best option or you might determine, you know what, for my mom, I, I want assisted living, I want a private pay, I'm gonna use this trust to do that. Great, that's what it's for. But if you determine, well, maybe I need a little more in this trust because of her particular condition. So I'm going to try, she's going to qualify for Medicaid and then I'm going to supplement her with this trust. Great. Mm -hmm. You know, you have options and that's, that's the key because if you left it all outright to a mother, for example, or father, uh, they just, they can't get any assistance until they spend that down. Yeah. It's kind of, you want to do everything right there, but you want to got to make sure you, that you go through those, I don't want to say loopholes, but the right way to do it. Well, yeah, and then they might, you actually might leave them all that money and then they gift it to your deadbeat sibling and then yeah. they get a transfer penalty. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, there's a transfer penalty. <laughs> it really is. I mean, there are, um, and you know, that would be a transfer penalty. I mean, we had a case in the past where actually a family member stole money from an elderly parent, oh. grandparent, like just took it from their account. We we're able to show to Medicaid that those were not proper transfers and they yeah. accepted it. We had enough evidence that that was not a willing transfer that that there was even a police report filed and and that helped but you know it's again those are that's how important that transfer penalty can be if it's if it's any transfer um even if it's just quote supporting somebody till they get back on their feet that's for our purposes for medicaid and for va we didn't talk much about va va is also another benefit available uh, for for veterans, obviously, and their spouses, and you always want to check that out to VA, and, and there's good local state VA offices you can contact, and they're excellent. They'll help you, and they'll even do applications for you. Um, VA and Medicaid, are they are both, for the most part, needs-based. VA, interestingly, has a three-year look back. Okay. Three-year look back, so it's a little different for VA benefits. Um, but if you're doing the five-year anyway, you're in the clear. You know, yes, right. Five, 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 you cover everything. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to kind of wrap up here, but is there anything that uh, we haven't talked about uh, that you think someone watching or watching in the future could really benefit about hearing about elder law in general? Sure. I, I, I think it's more of um, if this is a concern for you personally or for your family. Um, I'm, I like the idea, and I'm using this personally with family now. I'm using this, how I approach with clients, of coming up with a game plan. And I'm going to use a Good Alabama football analogy, you know, we're in Alabama football. And, you know, you have a game plan for any game that's coming up. You kind of know, you think what's going to happen, you have some tentative plans. But as the game goes on, you have to make adjustments. And maybe at halftime, you have to make some drastic adjustments. Or maybe your quarterback goes down. You got to make some really serious adjustments. Things happen. And so, you know, facing it like a game plan that you actually write out, here's, my, here's what I need to do. And then here's what I'm going to do in this situation, or here's what I'm going to do in that situation. Um, you know, what that makes you feel so much safer. You know, and if you have like an elderly parent and, you know, their spouse is their primary caregiver, what's your plan if that spouse goes down? Who, who's going to step in just tentatively? You know, they, uh, what would you do? Um, do the, you know, could, would there be a replacement? Could the kids step in and take turns and, uh, that's why respite care is so important. I always tell caregivers, you got to take care of yourself because if you go down, that, that messes up the whole plan potentially. You know, you're an integral part of the plan. So we got to take care of you. Yeah. And that kind of goes with like the vaccine. You, you know, healthcare workers are the first one to get the vaccines because you got to make sure they can serve. You do. You have to serve. And it's, and, but again, it's, it's that not being afraid to game plan and look at possibilities and look at things that come up and even plan adjustments. If this happens, then this, I mean, you don't want to go too far to drive yourself crazy, but you know, just, you know, basic and then make, and be willing to make adjustments. I had a client once it, he, he got it when I was talking to him, he goes, Oh, it's just situational. You just, you just make it based on the situation. He was an old military guy and he was used to that. You have a plan going in, but the situation governs what really happens. Yeah. You try to stick to the plan, but you make adjustments based on the situation. And that happens all the time with what we do. It's very situational. I, and I think you mentioning like having that game plan is very good and will put people more at ease. And I, I'd like to add to that, that something that puts me a little bit more at ease is 
also having a relationship with experts like yourself, just from us talking together over the last year, and we've um, done work together. You, you guys have helped me with some family things. Just having that relationship that someone can go to uh, has really eased my mind that no matter what comes at us in the, in the future, we'll work through it. No, that's true. Yeah, and that's why I think go back to that Nelf site. I mean, there's plenty of good folks. There's plenty of great folks here, and Nayla as well. Nayla, uh, anybody on that listing in Alabama uh, and, and in the country would be great to work with, and I frequently refer folks to, to other folks on either one of those lists. Uh, it's good to have, and then, you know, you have somebody who has the game plan in place, and then when something happens, you can call them, okay, this happened. What do we do now? We shift. Um, and we go to plan B or we go to this other thing, but thinking ahead and, you know, maybe and it, it, you, you're right, Alex. I mean, in it, when a scary world where things are happening, your game plan might be, you know, for me, it's dealing, you know, dealing with a family member. It's I make sure the power of attorney is in place, get a good handle on finances, educate myself more on the condition that I'm dealing with, the disability. That's for me, it's a good starting game plan. And yeah. then we go from there and, you know, that's phase one. That's kind of like your offense, defense, special teams. You got to have all three. To you get do. The it's, it's all components. You got legal. Yeah, there's something there about it, like legal, financial. We can. I got. I can expand this even more. So I appreciate the analogy. I'll, I'll, I'll polish it up for next time. Well, I appreciate you spending the afternoon with us here and, yeah. and helping us go through elder law. There's a lot of new information that I've come across. The five year thing, especially. Um, and I just want to say thanks again. We're going to go ahead and kind of wrap up. And then what I'm going to do is we're going to go through and post some links about our conversation today. Some of the resources that you guys have at Cardi Die on the sure. website. So. And any other resources we get. And if you get any questions or anybody wants to submit a question to you, you can email it to me. I'll be glad to answer it. You can post it on the, on the Facebook page. I appreciate that. Uh, at this point, Mr. Cardi, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye. And once again, thank you for being here with us. Enjoyed it. Thank you all. Have a great day. You too.